So this is my first experience in Europe and in Dublin. So um, I'm excited. You know, I'm always open to try new things. At the same time, it's super exciting, but you still got to treat it like a business trip. I mean, we're going to play football games. Here come the Irish. What a run! Touchdown! Play of the year for the Irish. Welcome back to the Indy on NBC podcast. I am your host, Corey Robinson. I used to play at Notre Dame way back in the day. Uh, before televisions, <laughs> before radio. But I'm happy because you know what this is. It's time for football season. It doesn't really feel like it. it you know, it's it's August. And it, it just doesn't feel like football is ready yet. So I wore my sweater vest because I'm not ready for the fall colors just yet. Just It's really hot here in New York. But I am stoked for this Notre Dame season because after that, after that bowl game last year where we saw – a, a spurt of life there in the second half, but then Mitchell Evans walk off uh, <laughs> touchdown in the fourth quarter. To me, that was a premonition. Perhaps this Notre Dame team can take it to the next level. Then we got a new quarterback transfer, Sam Harton. All these records in the ACC. He's coming in business mindset. We talked to Joe Alt uh, in this podcast. So he's going to be our first guest later on. He's coming off of an All-American season. He's going to be, in my mind, a first-round draft pick. Please don't tell him I said that. <laughs> but he's that good. He's amazing. Now, this team, though, I just want to, I just want to tell you how important this, this Ireland trip is because I was in Ireland over Easter this year. And when I was there, um, I was at a, at a pub in Belfast drinking ginger ale. It's a family show. And the, the bartender said, hey, you know, uh, we, we really love uh, college football here. We got this team, Notre Dame's coming in the fall to play Navy. And I was thinking to myself, why do you care about college football in, in Belfast? What? And I told him I went to Notre Dame. He said, no way. I, you know, I, I'm a huge Patriots fan, and I, and I love college football, and we all can't wait for Notre Dame. That was, that was four months ago. That was four months ago. So imagine the fanfare when we actually see it, see it in person in just a couple of days. But without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and throw it to Joe. All after Joe, if you stick around, me and Douglas Farmer will talk about this entire season. And I'll get Douglas's uh, preview on what to look for, where he's excited about this team, what are some potential concerns. And most of all, we'll talk about Ireland. Without further ado, All-American, Joe All. Joe, first and foremost, how you doing? How was the summer? Summer was great, you know, stuck around uh, South Bend the whole time, got some uh, lifting and conditioning in, and then on um, the free time, played a little bit of golf. Not great, but, you know, had to, had to pass the time doing something, enjoy it. So that's about all I did this summer. What, what, what are you shooting right now in golf, out of curiosity? 95. I'm not great. We play a lot of scramble, <laughs> a lot of four-team scramble. I help the team win. That's about all we do. I'm not I'm not anything special. You know, it, it seems like you've been pretty busy, too, traveling. A little bit. I saw on the, the Notre Dame uh, New York food tour you did. I live in New York. I saw you taste that street food, man. And I gotta say, your your scores are yeah. so precise. And I have to understand why. Like six point eight, seven point two on these kebabs. Yeah. Like what's with the pre the precision? Yeah, I think for me, it's you can't you can't just give a base score. You can give a seven or an eight because I think it leaves too much you know gray in there. Because someone might think a seven's like that's good, but that's not great. So I think when you put the points in there, you're okay, it's a low seven or it's a high seven. So you gotta get a better idea of how how good the really the food is. And I think it just gives a more exact answer because that's kind of how I'm kind of an exact, very straightforward person. So I like to give an exact answer. That's how I do it. I mean, you you definitely provided a lot of color. You know, I was thinking, man, that hot dog can't be that good. You know, it's only a seven point two for yeah. seven point five. You know, it's curious though about Dublin. Um, I, I know you guys are heading out there. I think tomorrow at the time of this recording, I'm not entirely sure when exactly yeah. you're leaving. But have you? Uh, what do you think about the food ahead of the time? Have you heard anything about the food there? And where would rank in that list? Yeah, we haven't uh, heard much about the food at all. I've, this is my first time, you know, traveling out of the country. I mean, I've been to Canada, like fishing, but never really like out of the country. So this is my first experience in Europe and, and in Dublin. So um, I'm excited. You know, I'm always open to try new things, but I have not heard much about the food or what were to be expected. What are you looking forward to most about this Ireland trip? Yeah, you know, at the same time, it's super exciting, but you still got to treat it like a business trip. I mean, we're going to play a football game, so you got to keep your your uh, your mind focused on what the, the task at hand is. But I think for me, you know, obviously staying in the moment, but a little bit just, you know, seeing somewhere different. You know, I mean, you're used to the, in the United States. You're used to, like, you know, the landscape, everything here. Just kind of seeing something different. You know, my family heads out there tonight, and they've already been talking about it. So I'm just going to kind of, you know, bus ride, just, you know, 
look around, look out the window, but don't get too distracted because at the same time we're going to play a game, and that's what's most important. You said you went to Canada on a fishing trip. You know, out of, out of curiosity, if, if you think about anywhere in the world, anywhere you'd want to travel or study abroad, maybe live abroad, you know, uh, was Ireland on the top of that list? Where, where do you want? Where, where is Joe interested in traveling? I think, yeah, for me, it's like I don't have a super like strong knowing of anything else. Like I've never been to Europe, so I don't really have like a play like a strong like I want to go to Rome or somewhere like that. You know, for me, so like anywhere in Europe would be really cool. Um, I guess. Dublin would be, would be super exciting just because now I'm going to get to experience it for the first time. So, uh, no, I don't have, like, a super specific place, but I'm really looking forward to going to Dublin. It should be a blast. Cool. You know, you, you uh, I saw the way that you um, have just transformed physically since you arrived there. I mean, look, I don't want to go through the whole story. But you basically gained 80 pounds of muscle, sorry. You came in, like, 240-ish, right? And then yeah. now you're at 322. Am I, am I right there? Yep. How, how have you been able to transform your body and uh, and grow into uh, this position as an All-American, you know, lineman looking to the next level? Yeah, I think for me, it kind of starts in high school. Um, growing up, I kind of always had a thicker build. Um, I didn't grow till like, you know, later sophomore year is when I kind of sprouted up. So I was kind of always thick, you know, to begin with. And I kind of, you know, got tall and was kind of skinny and lengthy. But I could just tell by like, the time my junior season junior season was ending and I was moving in my senior year, my body could just hold more weight and it was kind of taking it on. So once I started getting recruited, you know, some places told me, you know, we're looking at you play tackle committed here. Like when you play tackle. So I knew like, you know, weight game was the most important thing. So for me, it was just a lot of lifting and, you know, eating right and eating a lot just to put that weight on. And once I got here, you know, it was now more about, okay, I've gotten to the weight I want to be at. Now let's refine that. Let's, let's, you know, cut down, let's gain muscle mass, lose body fat. So that's what I've been kind of doing these last two years and kind of, now I feel really comfortable with the way that I'm at and how I've gotten there. In addition, to your your leadership skills. You know, I was watching an interview of you recently, and you're talking about how you know you want to instill this culture that was instilled in you, pass it to the young younger generation. Uh, what have you seen in just in your own leadership development over the years, from last year to this year, particularly? Yeah, I think for me, I got to leave a lot of credit to the past the past leaders in our room, you know, Jay Pat and uh, Josh Lug last year. We're just two great leaders who really held the standard of what Notre Dame offensive line play is and how to act and, you know, taking a lot from them. And I think for me, the big thing is it starts, you know, off the field. you got to have that accountability off the field, you know, in your room to make sure everyone's going to be on time, giving their full effort. Because if you don't have that buy-in off the field, you're never going to get on the field. So I think for me, it's building that, that camaraderie, that brotherhood off the field, and then that translate onto the field. And you have that connection with the guy next to you and everyone knows, you know, it's five as one. We're all playing together and we all want each other to succeed and that's what you know in my opinion the best offensive lines are playing when you're trying to play the best for the guy next to you and make him better and that's when you play the best so that's kind of what we try to instill in our group and uh, that's what we've been trying to work on what are the offensive line this season for you personally for the, for the offensive line as a unit yeah as, as a unit yeah what, what are your goals yeah. for your for your team yeah, for us, I think, you know, obviously the, the big goal is always obviously the, you know, Joe Moore award. That's the, you know, the biggest award you can win as an offensive line unit. But I think for us, we don't want to look at, you know, the big picture really for us. It's that's let's focus on today and let's win today. And what does that mean? I think that means holding each other accountable, playing five as one. And if we allow that to happen, we're going to play to our fullest potential. And that's our goal. If we play to our fullest potential, everything else will fall into place and that'll be where it's supposed to be. And at the end of the day, if we play to the best of our abilities, you can't really complain because that's all we can do. So that's kind of our goal is just to maximize each other, maximize the group, and make each other better. And that's what we're trying to do every day. You mentioned the, the Notre Dame offensive line tradition. Well, it starts, in my mind, with Harry Heastan, who, who retired recently. You know, he, he coached you last year, and now you have a new coach, Joe Rudolph. But can you can you tell me what exactly did um, Coach Heastan teach you when you were when you were playing for that? Yeah, for him, it was, you know, it was really kind of taking it to the basics, you know, the ground level of things. And he was very strong on you can't really have a you have to have a baseline before you can build up you got to make sure you got your footwork down your hand placement you know your pad level all that's where it starts so that was his biggest thing was us was coaching that and getting that groundwork so it's something i've always you know took pride in too it's always like you know when something's not going right you got to be able to fall training and fall back on what you've worked on so you have that you know that buffer you know you can fall back on your technique and that was the big thing he coaches on and this year, uh, what, what kind of what are the differences in Coach Rudolph's approach than Coach Heastan's approach? 
Yeah, I would say they're very similar. Um, but, you know, a couple of differences, just a couple of things, you know, like the run game, you know, a little more specific in hand placement and, you know, understanding, you know, gap runs versus, you know, uh, zone runs and how to use your hands and where to finish guys, how to finish guys. And then in, in pass pro, you know, maybe changing up your set here and there, understanding, you know, which foot of the defender's up and how you want to take them on at what depths and stuff like that. You know, it's a, you, you have a dad who's played in the league for a long time. I had a dad who played basketball, basketball for a long time. And one thing that I learned from my father was this idea that, you know, to be a great player, you have to get there where you're performing consistently every night, right? Against bad competition, against good competition, doesn't matter. But then to be in, like a in legendary, to, to be a transcendent player, you have to bring everyone else's level up. Right. You know, how do you see that now? Because you're all American, you know, you're, you're a great offensive lineman. How do you bring the rest of the group up with you? Yeah, I think it starts with just, you know, making sure you're, you're leading by example in the field and you're being that same guy every day and, you know, putting the work. And, you know, I, for me, it's I'm not a huge vocal leader. I don't want to be a vocal guy in the field. I want to lead by just, you know, pushing the tempo, pushing the pace and just being that consistent player, that consistent mindset. So everyone can kind of just trust it. Like, you know, Joe's going to be here in the side. He's going to be every day. So that's kind of my main thing. And then also with when it comes to that now, you know, as I've grown into this leadership role, you know, sometimes you do got to speak up because maybe it's just not getting the message across. And that for me, it's always kind of was instilled in this last year. It's just like going back on the tradition idea, like we have a standard here of offensive line play and we have to uphold that standard. And that's what we've been taught. So, you know, when things aren't going well, like, you know, that's my big thing is remind the group, like we got to uphold the standard. We're all here. We've been, you know, chosen to play here and this is how we're supposed to do it. So we got to pick it up. And that's kind of what I, what I rely on. I remember when I played a long time ago, you know, this was back years and years ago, I was playing with Zach Martin mm-hmm. and I remember being in the huddle with him and, you yeah. know, and it's just like, <laughs> he's a pro football point favor in my mind. Like he's, he's the guy, but you know, it's, it's at that really interesting kind of um, uh, relationship between, is, you know, when you're in the huddle, the quarterback, the leading and the offensive lineman leader, how do you and Sam work on that leadership together for the entire offense? Yeah, I think for me, it's, you know, you got to let, let Sam take the point on that one. You know, he leads the huddle. He's the quarterback. So I let him, you know, with, with the verbiage and everything, the communication, you know, he sets the tempo, getting out of the huddle. And then for me, it's just I like to start with my guys because I think, you know, I control my group the most. So, you know, five guys, making sure everyone's good, making sure everyone's on the same page, making sure everyone's heads up. You know, you know, we have blue by standard here, one play, one life. Don't let the last one affect you. We have the next one to play. So doing that. And then if I need to, you know, extend myself out into the tight end room because I'm just, you know, in our huddle right next to the tight end. So making sure they're good and, you know, just kind of working together to make sure we're all at our best, you know, playing 11 as one and trying to play our best football and reach our fullest potential is how we do it. And it's worked out really well so far. It seems when we talked about the transformation, you know, from a size standpoint, adding that 80 pounds, learning how to do that from a leadership standpoint, too. I'm curious, how have your conversations with your father evolved, uh, you know, as you've kind of grown up in Notre Dame? Yeah, I think for me, you know, it started off with just the basics. You know, he really started coaching me hard in high school because that's when I saw my advice from transform. So it was like tight end to tackle. So it's like, all right, let's just start with the basics. Let's learn how to, you know, how to set. Let's how to learn how to step properly. Let's learn how to get in the stands. You know, as it's gone on, you know, you start to get a hang of those things. They become second nature. And now for me, it's a lot of the the things you see, you know, game to game that may be a little bit different, you know, something that you're like, oh, I haven't seen this before. How would you approach this? And it's a lot more, you know, game to game thing. And at the same time, it's for and also with me, it's like new experiences, things I haven't seen because, you know, he's been through it, he knows it, and just his knowledge of the game, his knowledge of situations and being through it has been so beneficial for me because it just gives me a someone to like fall back on and just like, you know, follow that, find that trust and find someone who's been through it. So that's where I lean on my father the most. You're a mechanical engineering major, which is fascinating to me because what I knew a couple guys who were engineers. Some of them were walk-ons. Mm-hmm. You know, I think there was only one captain I knew who was that level in the yeah. classroom as well. It's just a hard, it's a demanding major. Mm-hmm. Have you been able to um, take what you've been learning on, you know, in the engineering classroom and apply it to football? Because what you're describing, discipline, precision, it seems like that there's a, a relationship there. Yeah, there definitely is. For me, I think it's just kind of like the, the technical things of it. You know, you have to be very detailed in engineering, you know, mindset. And you also have to be able to, uh, you know, you know, the big thing is working in groups. Like, obviously, you're playing a football team, you're working in a group. And and the other thing is you got to be able to troubleshoot. You know, you, you, you find things, you try new things, you might make a mistake. So for me, that kind of translates to football. Maybe you go out and try something new with your pass set. Maybe you're setting a little bit wider, or you're setting a little more vertical. And you just kind of tweak things. And I think for me, that's the big thing where, you know, you really got to, you try something new, you got to go back, look at it, analyze the same thing. If you know, in engineering, you're making a prototype of something and you're looking at it and maybe it doesn't work. You got to go back and fix same thing on the football field. Maybe I try, try to, I try to step, you know, eight inches at a six with my first step. And now let's see how that looks different, how that works. So it's really just, you know, trying something, then analyzing and just uh, fine tuning into something, you know, a final product that you want. 
this is, forgive me for sounding foolish, but it, it is interesting to be at that level you're talking about and your dad's level and you're talking about the nuances of the game and being willing to fail. I guess, how do you approach the, the, the game with that troubleshooting mindset where it's okay to try something and still, and maybe not succeed, even though you are an All-American and you have all this, you know, this responsibility and prestige? Yeah, I know. For me, it, at the end of the day, I've always lived by the motto, refuse and lose. You know, you're not, I'm never out the man across me beat me. So, for me, a lot of these things I'm saying, I'll, I'll try and practice or something that I want to try and do, try and drills. You don't really want to bring something to, you know, team time or one-on-ones until you're prepared with it and you've, you've repped it. So for me, you know, the, the, the biggest, the bottom line is refuse to lose. And we got to do whatever it takes to win that rep. And that's how I live by. So these things are things that I'm trying to, you know, perfect and get better at each and every day. And once I've, you know, really fine-tuned it and I really trust it, then I'll add it to my game. So just, just humor me. Let's say in the future, after a, a lengthy football career, you know, what, what do you want to do? What, what is something that's really piqued your interest outside of the field? Yeah, for me, I think there's kind of two schools of thought for me. One would be, you know, going into the business side of things and, and engineering. That's kind of the simpler, you know, the more practical route for me. The other one would be I've always uh, liked the idea of, you know, inventing and private contracting that idea. And I've always thought private contracting for the military would be really cool. You know, inventing and working on new things would be something that'd be really fun. Wow, inventing, inventing, like yeah. if you could come up with any pad, let's say, you know, like blank deck, what would you want to be in, like, an inventor of? What do you want to invent? I don't know. You know, for me, I've always been intrigued by, you know, I don't know, I've always been intrigued by what, like the people, like the army men on the actual ground where, you know, trying to figure out ways to make it safer, more protective, but also lighter because, you know, they're working the hardest out there and you want to make sure they're, they're comfortable at the same time being safe. So that'd be something I'd be interested in looking at. Fantastic. Wow, that's, that's a great great rabbit hole for me. I'm going to just Google that later. Thank you, Joe. Best of luck. Safe travels to Ireland. I hope you enjoyed. I hope your family has safe travels out there. Good luck. Thank you. I appreciate it. And now it's always a pleasure to welcome in Douglas Farmer. You know, look, we, you and I, we always have, we stand on different sides of the equation, a couple of different things. You know, one being in basketball, your team is the Timberwolves. You're a big fan of Anthony Edwards. I'm a big fan of the Spurs. Victor Wimbanyama. Go Spurs, go. But today we're talking Notre Dame, and you and I agree on one thing. We both love Notre Dame. So let's talk about this. You saw the interview with Joe Alt. What, what do you think about this young man and, and what he's going to bring to the team this year? I think there are approximately 131 college football teams who are envious of Notre Dame's left tackle. And there are approximately 132 college football teams who are envious of Notre Dame's tackle duo. It might be the best left, right tackle combination in the country. And and that's you and I can debate all sorts of things, including what you mentioned before. But when you get to guys like Joe all and Blake Fisher, I mean, Notre Dame's offensive line this year is as big as ever. It's crazy. And it's led by two possible two likely first round draft picks. And that raises the floor on any kind of ceiling. That's it, literally speaking, Michigan might be okay if they kept their tackles instead of these, but otherwise there's nobody in the country who wouldn't trade for Notre Dame's offensive tackles. You think about this new offense. We, there's a lot of headlines. One of them is Tommy Reese left for Alabama. Tyler Buckner transferred out. We have a new quarterback at Notre Dame, San Hartman coming in six year coming from Wake Forest. Uh, has all sorts of records left and right and left the record book in the ACC. And we have a new offensive coordinator, Gerard Parker. So can you just tell me um, what exactly are your expectations, knowing you have one of the best left tackle, right tackle duos in college football and all these new players around them? Uh, One of my expectations is halfway through the season opener in Dublin this weekend, you will start to realize it's Jared Parker pronounced like it's spelled with a J you, you instinctively, you aren't the only one who's taking these opportunities. And, and it's going to be very curious to see what offense he runs. He is the former tight ends coach. You assume he's going to want to lean on the tight ends, especially because Notre Dame still has Michael Meyer. May, Michael Mayer may be gone, but still has these very talented tight ends and a whole lot of questions at receiver. So is Jared Parker going to lean on what he knows and those tight ends? And how will that, how will that work with Sam Hartman, who has this great deep arm? You remember all these records he set, and so many of them were these just perfectly thrown deep balls to A.T. Perry and other Wake Forest receivers. Notre Dame might not have those guys yet, might not have them by season's end, but there are options on this offense to create. It's a question of how you balance Jared Parker's innate tendencies and Sam Hartman's strengths. We have no way to know what that's going to look like till we see it on Saturday against Navy. Do you think there will be any continuity – you know, between you think about historically Notre Dame teams, heavy run, heavy tight end, 
what 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 differences will you expect to see now? I mean, you still got Mitch Evans, like you said. There's some, some really good players there. The running back room. What are you expecting there? What jumped out to me during that Joe Alt interview was you asked him, "What did Harry Heastan leave you with?" And he said the fundamentals. Then you asked him, "What are the differences with Joe Rudolph?" And he first said they're very similar. And then he went into some zone blocking conversation. And some of that gets a little technical, but the fact that that's what he thought of suggests there's a change in the offense. And whether that's Jared Parker, whether that's trying to take advantage of Sam Hartman's career and the unique Wake Forest offense, or maybe that's just saying we need to create space for Audric Estime to run into people because Audric Estime is big enough that running into people is an effective strategy. I, I'm most excited to see how much Audric Estime gets showcased this year because he looks the part he acts the part and he had a couple of rough moments last year. He had two fumbles in particular, one cost him a game and one almost did. And the way he's talked about them, he remembers those. He wants to redeem that little bit. If there is continuity, it's in that you have Audrey Gastame, use him. Chris Tyree, now receiver. This is an interesting thing. If you, if you think about this young receiving core, if I looked at the spring game correctly, I saw three names as a true freshman potential. Who excites you on that receiving court? Chris Tyree is the highest ceiling, which isn't what you expect me to say. You're expecting me to say Tobias Merweather is the highest ceiling. But with Sam Hartman in particular, Sam Hartman's going to hit Chris Tyree in stride whenever Chris Tyree's open. Mm -hmm. And with Chris Tyree's speed, that's all you need. Tobias Merweather has the long-term highest ceiling. I mean, we try not to repeat this because sometimes things are so outlandish, you don't repeat them. <laughs> People say things that are so far gone that you just let them get away with it. But Notre Dame receivers coach Chancey Stuckey this spring, he compared Tobias Merriweather to Randy Moss. You, you don't do that to a sophomore in college. And he wasn't really saying he could have that career. He was saying he's that fast that he just runs away from guys even when they're at full speed. So Sam Hartman, if Tobias Merriweather takes a step, which we haven't seen yet, and I don't mean just on Saturdays. I mean, even this preseason, it doesn't seem like that occurred. If he takes that step, Sam Hartman and Tobias Merriweather could be a perfect combination. Let's talk about Jaden Thomas briefly, because, you know, he has he has a, like a body type that reminds me of someone like Chase Claypool, who was, you know, one of Ian Book's favorite uh, and also, yeah, one of, one of his favorite um, targets. He had some nice catches in the spring game. What's your ceiling on him? What's your take on on Thomas? I always counter that because Jaden Thomas is only six foot one and a half. I mean, you've had uh, other network broadcasters mistake him for a tight end, and it's hard to fault them because he's he's not the big tall receiver. He's just a big receiver. He had he still has this ability to present such a wide target. It's not to compare him to you, there's, what, five, six inches of difference there, but you always have that wide target for a quarterback, and it makes a quarterback's life so much easier. Sam Hartman might be really accurate. He is really accurate. You know what makes him even more accurate? When it's a target that wide. And it, Jaden Thomas, in my mind, of these receivers we've mentioned, he's the highest floor. He's the guy who this season – you can assume 40 catches. I don't know if it's going to be 60, but you can assume 40. That's a nice baseline. Yeah, I mean, think about all that production. You mentioned Michael Mayer, who's one of my all-time favorite Notre Dame players to ever. I mean, Jeff Samarja, Michael Mayer. I mean, there's Tyler Eifert. To me, they're, they're all in that realm for me. I, I really enjoyed watching him play. Over 60 catches, a lot of touchdowns. <laughs> who's going to that, – that's a great question. From that group, who's going to replace him? And also that freshman, I just want to say a couple names, Rico Flores, Jaden Greathouse also look for them. Now let's go for defense. This, when I was looking at the depth chart that was released, Douglas, I am telling you, sixth year, sixth year, senior, fifth year. It's unbelievable bringing back J.D. Bertrand, um, Maris Leofau. Where are you looking that's a concern and where's the strength on that defense? Uh, the concern is I'm not sold on the defensive line. We entered preseason practices with some skepticism around it, and it played well in preseason practices. And you can take that encouragingly because they're going against Joe Alt Blake Fisher. But I still need to see it against somebody else. Let's say I'll believe it when I see it. Like, Nana Safamensa, I've always thought he's very good, but he hasn't taken that kind of step. Jordan Botello has always been very hot and very cold. We'll see if he can get consistency. I'm skeptical there until we see it. The strength. You can mention the sixth year and the sixth year and the fifth year and three fifth year linebackers. The strength is a preseason All-American sophomore cornerback. Benjamin Morrison is 
that good. And then you combine him with fifth year cornerback Cam Hart, who if, he, if he'd been healthy in December, he'd be in the NFL right now. Legitimately, a November shoulder injury cost Cam Hart the NFL draft. I'm not saying he's an NFL starter right now, but he'd be on a 53 man roster. So that's your second, your number two cornerback, a NFL quality player opposite Benjamin Morrison. Uh, USC and Ohio State just exploited Notre Dame's defensive backs last year. And to their right, like it was there for the taking. They're not going to be able to do that this season, which changes the entire outlook of this year for Notre Dame and Marcus Freeman. What exactly specifically, you know, concerns you about that, that defensive line? It's all the material is there. Riley Mills is massive. Jason Anye looks, he's Riley Mills is backup. He looks like he's really gotten into shape. Jordan Botello, very yeah, physically gifted player. Yeah, always. But Jordan Botello was once sent home in the middle of the summer to decide if he wanted to come back. And that was years ago. But my point is like, you need at least one of these enigmas, one of these question marks to level up. I'm not saying replace Isaiah Foskey, but you need somebody that on every snap the opposing team is worried about. When you're replacing four of your top six tacklers, but you're bringing back three linebackers, three fifth-year linebackers, there's something there that's missing. And what's missing is a known problematic commodity on the defensive line. Or, or just anywhere in the – I mean, you think about the ball hawks I thought about, or just disruptors, I should say, excuse me, because obviously Benjamin Morrison, ball hawk. But disruptor, Kyle Hamilton, where, where is Kyle, right? You're talking about Foskey. Where is Foskey? So you don't, you're saying you don't have someone like that on this defense? I'm saying I don't know who that is. And mm. the – Kyle Hamilton, we knew. We always knew. Jeremiah Wilshikoromoa – Broke out. I believe it was his junior year when he finally broke out. And from there on out, you always knew. Right now, I'm not saying there isn't anybody. Jordan Mattello could be it. His Gator Bowl performance against South Carolina certainly showed he has that ability. Maris Leofau, assuming he's truly fully healthy, he dislocated his ankle in preseason practices of August 2021. Corey, you know enough to know that a dislocated ankle takes more than a year to really come back from. If he's full go, it could be him. But we don't know that, and I'm a believe it when I see it kind of person. I don't like to project, especially when you get to seniors in fifth years. You're supposed to project with sophomores who haven't mm-hmm. played yet. These guys, they haven't shown it yet. Until I see it, I'm not going to believe it. Just before we, we look at the actual schedule, because this is, I mean, two bye weeks here, so there are a lot, a lot of things we could pick out here and, and salivate over, but I, I want to ask you, did I miss anything, anything in particular – like jump out at you that I'm, I'm looking at the special teams. You have a new punt returner, a new kicker. Sorry, new uh, new uh, holder, new punter, and new kicker. Anyone else that you think on that roster that's interesting? Uh, the safeties room is suddenly a strength. It has been a weakness for a couple of years, Kyle Hamilton aside. But you've got four or five veterans and it's just going to be a, a relentless replacement there. And we probably didn't talk about Sam Hartman enough, but there will be a full season of Sam Hartman praise. He's going to be in the Heisman conversation for at least September. Should there be a Heisman conversation in September? No, but he'll be in it. <laughs> okay, now let's look at the schedule, shall we, Doug? So when you look at this schedule, I know you've been – I'm going to say this right now. This is this is the apology tour. You were right. You know, you were high on Clemson last year. I got distracted by Georgia's dominance. You know, I'm going to say this right now on the podcast. Douglas Farmer was correct. Clemson looks scary, scary. USC, Ohio State. Who else? Look, I mean, wh- where are you looking on this on this schedule? Hey, producer Matt, can you do me a quick favor and audio clip that sentence there and send it to my email? I appreciate it in advance. <laughs> this schedule, I mean, it's Don't rub it in. Don't rub it in. Ohio State, <laughs> getting Ohio State and USC at home is a huge help. Ohio State, there's a quarterback question. We still don't know who their starter is going to be. Today, Notre Dame starts in four days. Ohio State kicks off in 11. We should know the starter. USC still, like, I'm I'm wondering where Notre Dame's defensive playmaker comes from. I'm wondering where def- USC's defense comes from. So getting those two at home will be very helpful because those are winnable games, more winnable than they were last year. Uh, obviously, Clemson is going to be, if, if you're predicting a loss on this schedule, it's at Clemson. But aside from those you asked, There's going to be hype about North Carolina State, but we're getting them early. Notre Dame is getting North Carolina State before a new offensive system can fully find its groove. Pittsburgh will forever be a headache, but the the trendy play, I disagree with it, but the trendy play is going to be at Louisville on October 7th, and part Mm -hmm. of the trendy play aspect there will be it's the week before USC. If Uh Louisville doesn't look great in the weeks leading up, it's got talent. 
but that t- talent has to coalesce still. If it doesn't look great leading up to that, Notre Dame might overlook him. And Jeff Brom, you've seen him. Remember that 2018 Purdue-Ohio State game that October? Rondale Moore just ran all over Ohio State. That, that Jeff Brom offense always has that possibility. Even when it doesn't look like it's clicking, that's possible. Quick question for you. I, I don't want to say I'm scarred, but there is definitely trauma. I was there at Ohio State, and I was there at Marshall. And the Marshall loss, I was literally stunned. I was there stunned. Tennessee stayed at home, coming after this big fanfare in Dublin. A lot of players going maybe out of the country, like Joe said, for the first time. Where? How do you feel about that? Could that be a sneaky, you know, a sneaky game? I want to say this with the appropriate amount of respect. No, uh, Tennessee State is not. There are FCS teams that are good. There are FCS teams that could be a worry this weekend for that that game you're talking about, September second. Tennessee State's not one of them. It's Eddie George has a a tough rebuild ahead of him. This is his second season, I believe. Tennessee State is like 214th in the country if you combine the FBS with the FCS. We're not talking about a South Dakota State. We're not talking about a Northern Iowa. Tennessee State, it's going to be a fun weekend. To my understanding, the HBCU aspects are going to be played up, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh I'm way too far down the NBC totem pole to know why Central Michigan's on Peacock and Tennessee State's on NBC proper, but I'm pretty sure it's because Tennessee State's going to be a spectacle off the field and at halftime, and that's going to be fun. But it's not going to be a competitive game, even even if Notre Dame is tired from Dublin. It's coming west is the easy part, right? I, like I said, I, I was I thought the same thing last year after after that first half of OSU. I was thinking, oh wow, like. <laughs> They could have won that game. You know, Notre Dame could have won that game in Ohio State the first half. And then I was thinking Marshall should be a walk in the park. And then there I was my, with my jaw on the floor uh, at Notre Dame Stadium thinking, I can't believe that just happened. So I really hope you're right. I really do. I hope it's a fun weekend for Notre Dame fans. But we got to focus on the first thing, and that is Dublin, a beat stadium. I cannot wait. I, I was in Dublin in, in April, and it was already starting to bust. So I can't wait to see it. I'm sure we'll be texting about it, Douglas. Thank you so much for uh, jumping on the podcast. And be sure to download and Talk subscribe to, to the Notre Dame on NBC podcast on the NBC Sports YouTube channel and wherever you get your audio podcasts. Go Irish.